In this lecture, we're going to carry on looking at AI forms of movement. In particular, we're going to explore what's known as steering algorithms, which output an accelerative force, which we'll use this to update our velocity and update our position. These algorithms are quite um, flexible in the sense that they offer you a, a almost like a toolkit of different types of behavior that can be combined together uh, quite often to produce quite sophisticated forms of of movement. But we'll go on through and we'll have a look at these. So these, I think for, for most of the 2D games that we're looking at, um, a sort of smooth continuous uh, motion is what we need. They're, they're actually quite capable. Uh, also apply to 3D games as, as well. So for steering based movements, they, they're more a fancy form of the kinematic uh, algorithms uh, as opposed to outputting a velocity directly. They output an acceleration and we use that acceleration then to update our velocity. So we have a, a smoothly varying velocity. You get nice smooth motion and movement within our games. Um, we're gonna have a look at quite a few different types of steering behavior. You can see at the bottom from seek, flee, arrive, wander, pursuit of aid, interpose a line, and, and, and so on. There's a whole family and a whole set of these. And um, there's a number of quite basic forms. We'll have a look at those ones and other ones that build on top of them. But one of the nice things about the steering algorithms are that you can, um, that they're almost designed to be slotted and fitted together. Uh, so you can take, you're not to rest restricted to using one form, you can use a number of them and you can merge the results uh, together. Sometimes in merging them you need to be careful uh, about how they are combined because one effect can cancel another effect out and quite often I uh, don't want that to be the case. Though generally speaking it, it's, it's not too difficult to process um, to manage. So the whole premise or principle behind the steering algorithms is about matching a target property. Um, and, and in terms of these properties, that could be a position. So you want to have your position the same as another one. It could be a velocity, that your, your direction of travel and your speed matching some other target one. It could be an orientation in terms of, of mapping onto some defined orientation. So all of the steering algorithms, they, they operate on matching a single property uh, against some defined target position. Um, you can have the more advanced ones where you are looking at mapping them more than one or have certain constraints in terms of how they do this. And we'll briefly have a look at that, not in this lecture, but in the next one when we look at, uh, for example, how cars, which have constraint motion and movement in certain directions, um, can be introduced and can be implemented. And similar with the kinematic algorithms, uh, there's, these generally come in pairs. So if we have a seek behavior, then we'll have a corresponding flee behavior, which notionally is the opposite um, of it. So we'll start off looking, first of all, with seek and flee. Um, we'll do a bit of compare and contrast when we had a look at the kinematic algorithm to see how it's different here. Most of it's going to be the same. So seek is going to try to march or to match the target position. Uh, so we're going to move so that we're occupying the same position as whatever target we're looking at. That's the matching property in this case. We're going to determine the direction towards the target and we will output then an acceleration which will bring us towards that target. And you see the, uh, the diagram here that uh, we may be the, the green triangle. We're moving with the particular initial velocity and we're trying to move towards our green uh, pluses or target and we'll output an acceleration that drags us in that direction. And the acceleration then will smoothly change the velocity so that we will move ourselves down and then towards our target location. The actual algorithm uh, is very, very straightforward. In fact, it's almost identical to the one we used in the kinematic approach. Uh, we take in a source location, a destination or a target location, and we accept, in this case, our maximum acceleration, the strength with which we can accelerate towards our target. We're working out then uh, target minus source, which is a vector that separates our current location going out towards our target location. We're normalizing that. So that gives us a vector of length one, but pointing towards our target. And we're then scaling that up, multiplying it by the maximum acceleration, just how strongly we can accelerate in that particular direction towards our target. 
uh, and we return that acceleration. So it is as simple as that, but you have to remember for the seek based ones, the acceleration then will update the velocity, the velocity will update the position. So seek will accelerate as fast as possible towards the target. Um, that's useful until you get close to the target where ideally we want to be probably slowing down. It, it depends on, on what type of behavior. If we're trying to hit it, then no, we will accelerate all the way until we do end up reaching it. If we're updating seek, um, so updating the position, we will use our acceleration and uh, to update the velocity, again scaled by the, 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 the time step has been. Um, angular acceleration is the rate at which we change our rotation. So again, if some of these behaviors, not this particular one, this is seek is more about a position in space, but some of the other uh, steering behaviors will be concerned with orientations. Um, so, so we might have an angular acceleration being output. If we do, we want to update the rotation. Generally, we want to have a check then because maybe my acceleration um, has resulted in me moving greater or trying to move greater than my maximum speed. So I can check the length of my velocity is the speed in which I'm moving. If it's greater than my maximum speed, then I normalize my velocity. So I keep the same direction, scale it down to length one, and then bring that up to the maximum speed. Uh, so if, if I need be, I don't go faster than I'm allowed to go. And I can do a similar thing then for the angular acceleration. If we have a limit in how fast I can rotate to. Um, having done our checks, we then go to our velocity, use that to update the position, and our rotation, use that to update the orientation. Um, now, this algorithm, seek itself, it is simply concerned with the change in the velocity and the position doesn't change the orientation. There are other approaches that can do that and we'll see them later on. So if you want it to seek towards a target but to face in the direction that you're traveling, you actually would be um, combining two steering behaviors, a seek one and then an align one or look where you're going one. Flee, <coughs> beg pardon, is simply the opposite. So you accelerate away from the target as fast as you possibly can go. Arrive then, so this was the last of the kinematic ones. We'll have a look at how we can implement it using steering. It's gonna be more or less the same. Um, so arrive, we're gonna control the acceleration so that uh, as we approach our target, we will decelerate and we'll then come to a stop whenever we get sufficiently close to our target location. We need that. If we didn't have it, then for example, you can see two paths here. Um, one, we have a seek path, the dotted path, and because we're always trying to accelerate as fast as we can to it, we'll either end up in elliptical or circular orbits where we keep shooting and going around the particular uh, target. If we do arrive, we'll turn around, we'll go towards it, we'll slow down and we'll stop whenever we reach uh, our target point. We'll have two radii that we'll use here. One's going to be an arrive radius, um, a, rad or a radii, but whenever we are sufficiently close to it, we're gonna say, okay, we're sufficiently close so we can stop. And the second one then is a slow down one that whenever we reach that, we're going to start decelerating, reducing our velocity down towards um, zero. Uh, just a little side here, the opposite to arrive is leave. Don't really have any need for that. Leave would be a curious one, is where you accelerate slowly um, so uh, away from your target, and then as you move further away, you start accelerating faster. Now remember, we're talking about acceler acceleration and velocity. Um, so if you accelerate slowly, then you'll have a very slow change in velocity. Um, doesn't really make much sense. Uh, so generally, if we want to get away from something, we'll just flee from it. So the arrive algorithm looks as follows. We've got our source vector where we're at, our target where we want to get to. Our current velocity, because we, we need to know how fast we're moving to see if we're going to uh, try to accelerate or decelerate. We've got our maximum acceleration, is how fast we are allowed to accelerate in a direction. Our maximum speed, how fast we're allowed to move in a particular direction. The arrive radius, which is when we'll start slowing down, or uh, when we sorry, when we'll stop, when we've arrived. And the slow radius is when we'll start slowing down, when we're getting sufficiently close that we want to reduce our speed. It's going to be quite similar. Uh, again, you could pass this in or simply ignore it. We'll have some other factor we can use just to control how strongly we accelerate or decelerate. It could be a property, it just simply could be ignored. 
Uh, we'll have our acceleration that we're outputting, and initially we'll assume it's zero. Uh, so this will be the case where we've sort of slowed down, we've stopped effectively. We work out the direction. So target minus source gives us a vector from where we're at to where we want to get to. And if we take the length of that particular vector, that is the distance that we are away from our target location. And that's important because that ties into the arrive and the slow uh, radius values. If distance is less than the arrive radius, so we are sufficiently close to it that we will effectively have stopped. In that case, we just return a zero acceleration. We've got to our target, don't need to do anything. If that isn't the case, then we still have some more distance to go. We'll do two things. We're going to determine a target velocity. So this is how fast we want to be moving towards the target based on the distance that we are from the target. And then based on that velocity, we'll calculate, do we need to accelerate to go faster? Do we need to decelerate to slow down? So we'll have an acceleration that will provide us with our target velocity. So first thing is determine the target velocity. Uh, for doing this, we will, um, you know, the, the little side, if outside the slow radius, then we want to go at maximum speed. If we're inside the slow radius, then we want to sort of scale down based on the distance we are apart. So our target speed, if the distance is greater than the slow radius, so if we're sufficiently far away from it that we're outside our slow radius, then our target speed is our maximum speed. We want to keep going to it until we hit that slowdown radius. Else, which means we're within the slowdown radius, then in this case, the target speed is the maximum speed times distance divided by slow radius. So if we think about this here, the slow radius could be 10 meters. If we're five meters out, then five divided by 10 would be a half, and we'll go max speed times a half. So this is a linear slowdown, and uh, depending on how far we are away from our target. That gives us our target speed. Um, that speed is, 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 well, is a scalar value. We want to have then a velocity. So we are taking the direction, we're normalizing it, so that's heading that direction, and we're scaling that up by the target speed. So that gives us the velocity, a direction and a speed in which we want to be traveling. Determine acceleration then. So this is the bit that works out, well, what's our current acceleration? Are we going too fast? Are we going too slow? What do we want to change here? So we're going to calculate the acceleration so that we'll um, slow down near the target, or if we're sufficiently far away and we haven't sped up yet, that we'll speed up to our maximum speed. So acceleration is equal to target velocity take away current velocity. Now that will that will combine these two velocities into the, if you like, the current error, how much we are out of sync. And we use the, the slowing factor if you want to here in terms of, of, of sort of controlling how strongly we react um, to uh, any errors in terms of, of being off target. So if the, the acceleration length, if the length of acceleration, or if you like, our change in acceleration is greater than the maximum acceleration we can move at, so this is a check to see that um, what we want to do by way of a change, if it is greater than what we can possibly manage. Uh, if it is, then we keep the acceleration in the same distance, which should be target minus current. So this is, if you like, the error that we have and we'll scale it up to the maximum acceleration. So again, it's, it's exact same, similar notion to velocity, except here being applied to acceleration. And combined all of this then, we'll, we'll, we'll head towards, we'll accelerate up until maximum speed. Whenever we get sufficiently close to it, we'll decelerate and reduce the velocity down until we arrive, in which case we will have stopped and we won't uh, have any uh, net acceleration being output. Wonder. Is, is a new behavior. We had, didn't look at this in terms of the kinematic one, but it's a useful one in terms of uh, steering behaviors. So Wonder produces movement that gives the impression of a random walk. Often within a game, you want the character to be ambling about within your, your level, and Wonder's a way of doing this. How do you get it to give the appearance of randomly walking about? Uh, it turns out that there's actually a quite nice way of doing it. We imagine that the object has a circle that is projected out in front of it. So whatever direction it's going, there's a circle projected straight out in front of it uh, at some certain distance and at some certain radius. And on that circle, constrained to that circle, we have a target. And that target moves randomly around the circle, different directions, different speeds. And we'll always head towards that target. That is our seek location. 
And if we do that and we play it, we actually will have a behavior which is kind of like a random wander um, about a level. Um, so each update, the target is spaced by a small random amount and will then seek towards that target. And the nice thing about this is that by varying the properties, for example, the radius of the circle, how far it is projected out from us, the distance it is in front of us, how much uh, the, the target moves around the circle each frame, we can have a very wide range of abilities, which is kind of going in a straight line with a bit of variation. So it's almost dance-like abilities where the characters are sort of pirouettes about um, the scene. So it's a very flexible setup. How can we implement it? Um, well, you can see a setup here. So if you look at the diagram over the right-hand side, we've got our source, or triangle. In the direction of, that it's facing, um, we have a wander offset a certain distance out. Uh, we have, if you like, the centre of our circle. That circle is going to have a particular radius. Um, and again, there'll be a wander orientation, which is where our target, or the wander target, is around that particular circle. And the wander rate then is how much it changes its position from one update to the next. So calling wander, we pass in our source vector where we're at, our source orientation, the direction in which we're pointing, uh, maximum acceleration, these, these are angular accelerations. This is the maximum angular acceleration, the rate at which I can change my rotational speed. Uh, my wander offset, which is how far out the center of the circle is, the wander radius, how big that wander circle is. Wander rate, how fast it changes. And wander orientation, again, whereabouts it currently is in terms of that circle. Okay, so that's our input that we pass in. So initially, we work out a new location of our wander uh, orientation. Um, so we're, we're moving our target somehow around that particular circle. Um, now you could do it sort of minus one to plus one, so it moves a bit in either direction. Uh, the random binomial here basically, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, a bell-shaped curve that most of the times it'll be a small change, occasionally it'll be a big change, it gives you sort of slightly smoother um, motion. Just a random function could work as well. That updates our target uh, location relative to it on that circle. Um, now we want to, we've got moved in the circle, but we want to have an actual location, a position that we seek to in the world. So all the things we're going to do now is to take that notional location which we've described on the circle and to convert it into a actual location within our game world. So we do this here by saying our target orientation, where we want to be orientated towards, is equal to our wonder orientation, which is the circle, then add on the source orientation. That's the character's uh, position relative to the character. Those two things combined then will give me our target orientation for that character. We want to work out a target position then. So there's a few things going on here that um, we've got the source, where I'm currently at, and I add on to that my wonder offset. So this is the distance that the center of the cir circle is. Um, and I, I'm basically stepping that distance out based on the source orientation. This is how I'm facing, add on to that the wander offset. So that, that in essence says the target, the first target we're calculating here is the center point, the location of the center point of that circle. So where I'm currently at, step out in the, my source direction, a distance uh, based on wander offset. That'll bring me out to the center of the circle, which is good. And then I want to have a further step out to whereabouts on the circumference of that circle is my target. So target plus is equal to, so I'm adding a bit onto the target, and it's going to be my wander radius, which is how, what's the radius of the circle, how far I have to walk along to get to the circumference, and my target orientation as I've calculated. So those two things combined will take my current source location, walk out to the center of the circle, then walk out to the target where it currently is defined on the circumference of the circle. That's all the hard work done. Um, oh, just a little side, if, if you want this as vector method, so if I pass in an angle, um, assuming here in radians, and I want to get a vector, an x and a y component that corresponds to that, and you can see here using the cosine and the sine of the angle. So this is almost the opposite of the arctan 2 which gives, given a vector, give us an angle. This, if I give an angle, gives us a vector. So we can do conversions from one to the other. 
Anyway, now that I've calculated my, my location of my target in the world, um, I simply seek towards that particular location using the same seek method that we had defined uh, earlier on. And that will give me my output acceleration. That's what I use. Next frame, we move it again along the circle, give us a new seek target and seek towards that. Pursuit and evade are the next two forms of steering behavior we want to have a look at. Um, now, seek, seek's useful. Seek heads towards some target location. But if you're chasing something, it's actually suboptimal to head towards where it currently is. It is better to head towards where it is going to be. So you seek towards where you think the object is going to be in the future, not where it currently is, because it's going to be moving itself. Um, notice pursuit. Now, you might sort of think, oh, trying to predict where it's going to be, that could be a difficult thing. Actually, it turns out that it's reasonably easy to make a good uh, guess. So the guess is that you assume it is going to be moving in a straight line and will continue to move in a straight line. Now, obviously, that's a very poor assumption in some respects. But if I'm updating my guess 10 times a second, then assuming that it's going to move in a straight line is actually a fairly good assumption to make. Um, because if I'll, I'll, I'll be roughly, partially right based on the direction, but a tenth of a second later I'm going to refine it, then I'm going to refine it, then I'm going to refine it. So that gives us a way of, of if, you, if you like, sort of homing in um, on, on where it's going to be. So how do we do the, you can see here, you actually will have a change in the, the route that's calculated. You'll get a better, more efficient route towards it. The algorithm for this is uh, reasonably straightforward. We've got our source, we've got our target. Uh, so again, that's, that's much the same then as, as seek. We've got a source velocity and a target velocity. Um, so there we need to know what my speed is and what my target speed is, because these two things will, will come into how we calculate this. Um, we've got a maximum prediction. Again, you can pass it in or just find it's a property for it. So this is the maximum time ahead that I'm willing to predict. So I might say that I'm, I'm willing to predict where my target's going to be up to two seconds into the future. Uh, and we'll see the reason we have that in, in a second. So we're going to do a few things here. Um, we've got a vector direction is equal to target minus source. So we've seen this before. This gives us a, 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 a vector between where I'm at and where I'm going to. Um, the direction dot length is the distance I am apart. So this is my current separation, how far I have to go. And my speed, so this is the speed I'm traveling at, is my source velocity and the length of that. So I've got here, crudely speaking, well, not crudely speaking, but I, I've got here the distance I am away from my target, and I've got the speed that I'm currently moving in. And I'm assuming that I'm, I'm roughly moving towards my target. Now, not necessarily, but, but roughly that's the assumption I'm going to be making here. Now, um, We'll go through the code and then we'll have a look at why we do this. So if speed is less than or equal to distance divided by max prediction. So the, the distance I am apart, if I divide that by the maximum prediction and I compare it to my speed, what I'm basically asking here is that do I think I am roughly going to arrive at the target uh, in, in how many seconds? Is it going to be less than my maximum number of seconds that I'm willing to predict? Uh, now, it's going to be true or false. If it is false, so, so effectively, um, I, I'm only willing to predict up to two seconds ahead. When I have a look at this, it works out, I'm going to take me five seconds to get to the target. In that sense, I'm only going to predict up to my maximum prediction ahead. So if it's way, way off, then I'm just simply sticking to my two seconds ahead, my maximum prediction, no more than that. Um, the else bit, that holds if I think based on the distance I am away and the speed at which I'm moving, I'm going to get there quickly. I'm going to, I'm going to take me, say, half a second uh, as opposed to my maximum of two seconds that I'm willing to predict. So in this case, if I believe the time until it's going to take me to get there is less than my maximum prediction, then I go with the time that I think it's going to take. So a little bit there sort of um, means that we're not going to predict massive distance into the future, which gives us the, error to, uh, the probability of doing errors. And as we get closer to it, then we will narrow when we will just the amount that we're predicting ahead because we think we're going to reach it fairly quickly. Um, 
Having calculated then our maximum prediction, just how far forward in time we're willing to predict, we go to our target, we say to the target, okay, I want to have your location, I, I believe you'll be in this step time, based on your velocity, multiply by the duration that I'm willing to predict ahead. And that will give me the target's location as if it continues to move in a straight line times the, the amount that I'm willing to predict ahead. And that effectively is my seek target. I predicted where I was, I think it's going to be, that's where I seek towards. Um, and that then will give us that nice um, pursuit type behavior. Evades the direct opposite of this. So something's chasing me, I'm looking at how it's moving, and I try to run away from the location where I believe it will be in the future. So again, this is a more efficient way of trying to avoid your pursuer is not to avoid where it's currently at, but where you believe the pursuit is going to be in the not too distant future. Interpose is related to these ones. So interpose um, is where you're trying to steer between the midpoint of two defined targets, get in the middle between them. Um, now this is the type of thing you might want to have for, for blocking or intercepting a pass, used quite often in sports games, things like that. And you can see example at the top is uh, where we have two arrows moving in certain directions. We can look at their midpoint, and that's the, the sort of the point that's midway between their two center points. Um, now, similar to pursuit in terms of interpose, that we're not really interested where they're currently at. We're interested in how they're moving and where we believe they're going to be. And that's shown then at the bottom that we predict their future location. Uh, we look at their future locations, we take the midpoint of that. And that is what we seek towards. So implementing this then, similar to, to Pursuit, except we'll try to get between two different objects. Align. So we're now going into to ones that all of the, the, the previous forms of steering behavior were concerned about positions and movement in space. Here we're concerned about orientation and things like that. So we'll start off with Align. Align is going to be our basic form. It's, it's similar to Seek, uh, I suppose, in terms of the movement ones. So a line tries to match the orientation of the source with that of the target. Uh, there's no linear movement, we're only going to rotate the object around. It's going to be actually very similar to arrive in terms of the algorithm that we will be using here. Um, so as we get closer to our target, we'll actually we'll slow down, we're not going to overshoot it. There's some small complication in this, in that uh, if we're thinking about the orientation, then it is something that repeats. It's going to be cyclic. Every 360 degrees, it repeats and it goes around. Um, because of that, we've got a method, you can see over here, called standardized angle, that will take in any angle and will turn it into the minus pi, minus 180 to pi plus 180 range. Uh, now, there's different ways of standardizing. Sometimes it's from 0 to 2 pi, 0 to 360. Here we're doing minus 180 to plus 180, or minus pi to pi. How do we do that? Um, we simply use the modulus uh, based on the input angle. And, and then depending if it's greater than 180 degrees, we're going to bring it back around so that it's in the, the minus 180 up to 0 range. Uh, but we're going to have to standardize our angles then within our align behavior. Again, we'll have two trigger points. One for where we're sufficiently close to our target orientation, we just stop. And the second one is that whenever we're getting close to our target orientation, we start slowing down the speed at which we are rotating. So we gradually come to a stop in terms of our orientation. Algorithm will be very similar. We've got a source orientation, where we're currently pointing, our target orientation, how we want to be pointing. Our maximum angular acceleration, so this is the strength at which we can change our rotation. Our maximum rotation, the, the, the maximum speed at which we're allowed to rotate. Our arrive angle, uh, so this is the one where we will um, have, be sufficiently close that we're willing to stop. And our slow angle, where we think we should start slowing down. And it's going to be a similar set of functions within this. We've got a slowing factor, again, it could be a parameter, you can simply ignore that one. Our angular acceleration initially is equal to zero. And so this is where we, we get into some of these, these uh, specific aspects. So standardize angle target minus source. So this is looking at, okay, what is our target orientation, our source orientation? And this gives us our rotation, or if you like, or the desired um, change that we're trying to bring about. And you can see here the rotation size is the absolute value of that. So it might be plus, plus 10 or negative 10 in terms of the, the rotation, if we want to move to the right or move to the left. 
But really, for a lot of this processing, we're just concerned with how far out we are. So it doesn't matter if it's plus 10 or, or minus 10, we just want to know it's 10 degrees out. So we're taking the absolute value, this gives us the absolute error. So rotation size is how much of the correction we want to bring about. Now, if the rotation size, so the, the error effectively, is less than the arrive angle, so if we're allowed to be within one degrees of our target one and we are, then we don't have to do anything, we'll return zero. Else, we want to work out, okay, what is the target rotational speed we want to put in? We know our error, so how much do we, what speed do we want to be changing orientation towards our target? And then based on that speed, what sort of angular acceleration are we speeding up or are we slowing down? So again, same as the arrive behavior we saw before. Our target uh, rotation, initially we're assuming a rotational uh, velocity of zero. If the rotation size is greater than the slow angle, so we're, we're quite a, a distance out, then we're going to go for maximum rotation. Uh, the else here is where we're getting close to it, so in that sense we're going to slow it down, and it's a linear slowing down. So for 30 degrees out, um, and, and uh, sort of, you know, the, the, say 60 was our, our, our slowdown speed, we will rotate with half of our rotational speed. Um, now, the rotation, rotation will be a direction. We're going to rotate to the right, we're going to rotate to the left. So the bit we have down at the bottom is where we put the signum in. So signum is plus one for positive numbers, um, minus one for negative numbers. So having worked out the absolute rotational speed um, using the, or sorry, the rotational um, um, uh, target that we have for it, we then work out the correct direction. Is it to the right? Is it to the left? And we're going all the way back to the rotation that we calculated at the start, which embedded turning to the left, turning to the right. Angular acceleration then, so this is similar to the previous one. Uh, we work out, okay, our target rotation, take away the source one. Uh, so this is ideally uh, the speed at which we want to rotate it with. You can put your slowing factor in here. And um, again, we're using the absolute angular acceleration to work out if we're trying to have a stronger angular acceleration than we're permitted. If so, then we divide it uh, down and we scale it back up to the, uh, the max angular acceleration. So more or less exactly the same as arrive, except using a little bit of, um, of conversion because we're dealing with angles. Um, and we have to be concerned about absolute values here and actual direction in which we are rotating. So face is a, an extension then of a line. It uh, steers the source to look at the target. So I can give a, 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 an object and I can ask uh, the other AI controlled object to, to look towards that, to face towards it. And it'll change its orientation so it always keeps looking at our target. Um, very straightforward, you can see the code down here. We've got a source, we've got a target. I work out the direction from the target minus source is how far it's out. If we're not exactly on top of it, then we align with that particular direction. We, we simply look in, in the direction that we have there, and that will make sure we always point towards our target location. Look where you're going is another similar related form of a line. Uh, so in this sense, we're, we're basing on the velocity of the object, and whatever velocity, change in movement and speed and direction we have, this is the direction in which we will look. So in this case, our object will be rotating its orientation so it always points in, in the direction of movement. Uh, so a small check about the velocity, you see that at the bottom, make sure we have one. We're using our arctan2 to give us an angle uh, from the velocities, the x and y component, and then we're aligning with that particular direction. So again, not really much more to that. Um, separate then. Separate is, is one of the more interesting forms of steering behavior and this is where you start getting into looking at relationships of other objects and it's a very useful one for things like collision uh, avoidance. So the idea behind separate is that we're going to have a number of objects, you can see this over in the diagram on the right, and each object I'll, I'll, I, want, I will not want to get too close to it. So if I get too close to it I'm going to have a um, flea behavior pushing me away from it. And we can have a number of different objects, and each object can um, provide a certain strength, a separation strength from it. So you can see here 
that uh, based on the, 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 the three sort of pluses, each plus is going to give me a vector pushing me away from it. And we will have a, um, the closer that I am to it, the stronger the vector is going to be pushing me away from it. And if I add up all three, we have a net acceleration then that sort of brings the, the character away from those three in sort of a, a combined uh, direction. So it's useful if you have a whole bunch of objects, but we don't want them to really to group on top of each other, but to try to maintain their distance uh, apart. Algorithm for this, we take in our source where we're at. We take in an array of targets. So these are the things I'm trying to avoid. Uh, I've got a separate threshold. So this means that I'm, if I'm outside my separate threshold, I don't care about the object. But as soon as I enter into that separate threshold, I want to try to move out of that threshold, to move away from it. I've got a separate decay, and this is going to come into the strength of which I try to avoid this. So that when I just go in, maybe I'm not really that interested, I have a small inclination to move out. As I get closer to it, my uh, need to move apart is going to increase. And I can control that then using my separate decay uh, value. Max acceleration controls how strongly I can accelerate away from the thing. So what do I have? Initially, so my, my acceleration will be zero, uh, be it an x and y or x, y and z, depending on two or three dimensions. I'm going to look at each of the objects that I have in my target array because each of them can be causing me to move away from it. Um, I'm going to look, take it the direction from the target to where I'm at. And the length of this direction uh, gives me the distance that I am away from that particular target. And I compare that distance to the separation threshold. So if it's less than the separation threshold, that means that I'm, I'm actually closer than I want to be. So I want to have an accelerator force pushing me away. So in this case, I want to calculate how far ideally or at what strength, ideally, I want to move away from it. Um, so then it's going to be the um, minimum of my separation decay. So this can be sort of my base one. I'm using times distance times distance. So this uses a quadratic equation. Uh, so that the closer I get to it, the, the more compelling, the stronger the need's going to be. And I can use the separation decay then to control that. You can also use a linear fall off as well, but the, the quadratic one it has a much stronger effect the closer you get. So when you get in very close, it tries to push you away as strong as you can. Um, got a minimum of these two things because the separation of k times distance times distance could be a very large value. And that being the case, I'll, I'll truncate it to my maximum acceleration. I can't have more than that, so that's what I'll restrict it to. And I then, having calculated the, the overall strength, I go to my net acceleration vector. So I'm going to build this up. So I'm adding it on to it. So every single time I want to move away, I'll add this up into my net acceleration. So direction.normalize times separation strength. So I, I take the direction that I am towards the object, and I'm moving away based on the strength that I've calculated. So for that particular object, I will then try to move away from it if I'm less than separation threshold. And the strength I move away will depend upon the distance and also depend upon my decay factor. Now, that's the bottom of the for each. I do that for each single object and I accumulate up my net acceleration, which will try to keep me separated from all of these objects. I have a final check at the bottom because in adding all of these things together, I might have ended up with a, a, an overall acceleration which is faster, stronger than I can actually provide. So in this case, I finally check to see if the strength of my acceleration is greater than the maximum acceleration. Then, OK, keep the right direction, but truncate the acceleration down to the maximum permissible value. And that's what I return. So that's all we want to look at. There's actually um, quite a few other ones in the next lecture. We're going to go on to, 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 to look at a few other ones and also look at how we can combine these things together in richer ways. But um, steering algorithms, there, there are lots and lots of different types of them. And each of them are nice. They sort of provide you with some useful functionality that you can put in by way of controlling the behavior. The real power of steering algorithms, and we'll see this in one of the later lectures, comes from combining them together. That I could have an object that is trying to seek towards a target, that is looking in the direction that it is moving, whilst at the same time is trying to separate itself from a bunch of other targets. And by combining these three things, I'll have 
something that tries to head towards a target, avoids other obstacles, and sort of looks in the direction in which it's moving. So they all build up quite nicely.